speak on, so that you won't think I'm cheating, I'm speaking on something that is in one of my books. Uh, and when you buy the book, you can say, oh, you know, this guy just memorizes his writings and gives it. But I did feel moved. It's different. When I got here, I told you I'm changing Sunday morning. And this is what I changed to. I want to read a lengthy passage. I know most contemporary preaching, we read a, a verse or two or half a verse or something. But I'd like a major portion of this passage before us together, if you don't mind. So John chapter 21, as I told you on last night, um, that last night and this morning are both post-resurrection appearances. So this is John chapter 21. After these things, meaning the passion and the other events in Jerusalem. After these things, Jesus showed himself alive again to the disciples at the Sea of Tiberias. And on this wise showed he himself. They were together, Simon Peter and Thomas called Didymus and Nathaniel of Cana in Galilee and the sons of Zebedee and two other of his disciples. Simon Peter saith unto them, I go a fishing. They said unto him, We also go with thee. They went forth and entered into a ship immediately, and that night they caught nothing. But when morning was now come, Jesus stood on the shore, but the disciples knew not that it was Jesus. Then Jesus saith unto them, Children, have ye any meat? Let me just paraphrase. It's the age-old question. When you walk out on a pier where people are fishing, you almost can't keep from saying it. Have you caught anything? Have you caught anything? They answered him, No. And he said unto them, Cast the net on the right side of the ship, and you shall find. They cast, therefore, and now they were not able to draw it for the multitude of fishes. Therefore that disciple whom Jesus loved saith unto Peter, It is the Lord. Now when Simon Peter heard that it was the Lord, he girt up his fisher's coat on, onto him, for he was naked, and he did cast himself into the sea. And the other disciples came in a little ship, for they were not far from land, but as it were about 200 cubits, dragging the net with fishes. As soon then as they were come to land, they saw a fire of coals there, and fish laid thereon, and bread. And Jesus saith unto them, Bring of the fish which ye have now caught. And Simon Peter went up and drew the net to land, full of great fishes, and hundred and fifty and three, for all there and and for all there were so many, yet was not the net broken. And Jesus saith unto them, Come and dine. And none of the disciples durst ask him, Who art thou, knowing that it was the Lord? Jesus then cometh and taketh bread, and giveth them, and fish likewise. Now this is the third time Jesus showed himself to his disciples, after that he was risen from the dead. So when they had dined, Jesus saith unto Simon Peter, Simon, son of Jonas, Lovest thou me more than these? He saith unto him, Yea, Lord, thou knowest I love thee. He saith unto him, he, the pronouns are confusing in the New Testament sometimes. He, Jesus, saith unto him, Peter, feed my lambs. He saith unto him again the second time, Simon, son of Jonas, lovest thou me? He saith unto him, Yea, Lord, thou knowest that I love thee. He saith unto him, feed my sheep. He saith unto him the third time, Simon, son of Jonas, lovest thou me? And Peter was grieved because he said unto him the third time, lovest thou me? And he said unto him, Lord, thou knowest all things. Thou knowest that I love thee. Jesus saith unto him, feed my sheep. Put your hands on your Bible, if you will. And let's pray together. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this morning that the sun also rises. We believe you and thank you that it also rises in our hearts and lives. In the beautiful name, the strong name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. This, uh, this little story, this little account of the encounter with the post-resurrection Christ is so human in so many ways that we can almost just see it as a good fun story and miss the dynamics of inner healing that are happening. This, this is a story about emotional and spiritual healing and a very profound and, and may I say it even technological way. The technique here is, is powerful. 
So Simon Peter, remember, only days earlier, has had a very public failure. Now you can call that whatever you want to, but it was scandalous. So he has had a public failure. Everybody knows it. That he, he really was craven. Noah, weren't you with Jesus? In the, in the courtyard at Caiaphas' house. This is only just a few days later. Weren't you with Jesus? No. I don't know who you're talking about. Weren't you with Jesus? No. Remember the three denials? Yes, you're, you're a Galilean. We hear your accent. You're, you're obviously from the deep south. I mean from Galilee. And <laughs> we hear your accent. You can't deny it. And uh, it says the third time he denied Jesus with a curse. Do you know Jesus? No. Do you know Jesus? No. Do you know Jesus? Hell no. They say, okay, well, now we believe you. And everybody knows this story. Peter is so overcome with grief that he doesn't even go out to the cross. John goes to the cross. Not Jesus. Not, not Peter. Then Judas Iscariot hangs himself. The whole crowd has fallen to pieces. It's devastating. Now they have the beginnings of the first post-resurrection appearances of Christ. And in the midst of all of this, everything that he's dealing with, Peter goes back to that which is familiar to him. This is, this is one of the realities of, of humanity, is that in crisis or failure, we often go back to what we, we feel comfortable with. What doesn't challenge us, what doesn't change us, we go back to that. This is one of the reasons that in emotional failure, we tend to self-medicate with whatever it is, alcohol or drugs or sex or whatever it is, self-medication is what feels comfortable and easy to us. Peter says, I'm going fishing. This appeals to me. I'm a, a bass fisherman who's at the obsessive compulsive level now. And, uh, and it seems very real and masculine and, and human to me. He says, look, in the midst of this bizarre story of arrest and crucifixion and torture and failure and resurrection, I mean, he, the, their minds are blown. And he says, you know, I can't do this anymore. I'm going back to Galilee. I'm going back to Tiberias, uh, to the Sea of Tiberias, Sea of Galilee. I'm, I'm going back to home and I'm, I'm going fishing again. And the other guys say, we're coming too. So they fish all night and it's fruitless. And then they see this guy on the shore and he says to them, have you caught anything? No, we haven't. Now, how many, I've been to the Sea of Galilee 49 times. Anybody, anybody else been to the Sea of Galilee? Then you'll know many good. I've been, I've been in Israel 48, 48 times. I went to Galilee more than once. So, um, it, the, Any kind of fishing has to be done at night because the waters are so clear. So when the sun comes up, fishing's over. So the guy on the shore says, have you caught anything? No, we haven't. Cast the net on the right side and you will. It's not even clear why they obey that. I mean, you could say maybe something that he can see some way that they can't see, some ruffle in the water, something. But the fact of the matter is, Jesus is rehearsing a scene that they've already been through. They just don't recognize it at first. So we often ask ourselves, in all the post-resurrection appearances, why don't people recognize Jesus? I think there are several reasons. One is entirely human, and that is when you've seen someone killed and then you see them again, it's hard to make your brain believe your eyes. The other thing is we don't know what this experience of being killed, raised from the dead. Remember, he ascends to heaven 
and pours his blood out on the mercy seat and returns. He says to Mary in the garden, touch me not, I've not yet ascended to my father. So we don't know what that transition, earth, grave, earth, heaven, earth. We don't know what that does. We don't know how changed he is. So this is, this is a whole thing that's beyond us. So they don't recognize him. They throw the net in and it, the net bulges. Does this, re, you see what it is? He's, he's recreating the scene when they were first called. Remember when they pull in, the nets begin to break and they call the other boat over. And then Jesus says, follow me. And it says, and leaving their nets and their father, Peter and the sons of Zebedee go with Jesus. He recreates the whole thing. Even still, Peter doesn't get it. I, I love this guy. <laughs> it's John. It's John, the sensitive one. It's John, the mystic. John says, that's Jesus. And then good old impetuous Simon Peter, he just pulls on his outer garment and dives in. Now, I, I can give you all kinds of explanations for that. And perhaps this is only born out of my own misspent youth. But I wonder if there are any other men in the room who, when you were schoolboys, you were sent to the principal's office. Am I the only one? Thank you. Thank you, sir, for your honesty. Thank you. Thank you. God bless you. We forgive the rest of you liars. <laughs> you know, it used to be, used to be you misbehaved at school, which was chronic with me. When you misbehaved at school, you went to the principal's office. You, you got a, a licking. They didn't, you know, was, nobody cared about yourself, you know. Uh, and uh, so when you're going to the principal's office to, for a licking, you don't want the other boys to watch. I think Peter dives in the water and swims ashore because he knows he's going to get a tongue lashing. He knows what he's going to get. I, I know if nobody wants me to be God, but if I know that if I'd been Jesus, I would have said, you, sit over there. Don't, you, can, you can be here, but don't talk. And that's what, that's what Peter's expecting. All the way ashore, I think he's rehearsing his confession. I think he's going through again. Okay, I'm going to say this. I'm going to say that. I'm going to do all this. And when he gets to the shore, there's fish and bread. Jesus, how, what an amazing insight into the resurrected Christ. It should, to those of you who are cooks, it should be very encouraging because the resurrected Christ sanctifies the act of cooking. That he's cleans fish, toasts bread, and, and it's, a, it's a very much a housekeeping kind of thing. And he prepares it. The resurrected Christ. He doesn't speak the bread into existence. He makes toast and, and fish. And he says to, to Peter, come and dine. Now, then begins this interrogation. Three times. Do you love me? Yes, Lord, I love you. The first question is, uh, is added with this odd question. Do you love me more than these? And theologians and preachers have made much over it and argued over it for 2,000 years. More than these, what? <laughs> more than these meaning more than the food? Do you love me more than these other guys love me? No, actually, <laughs> nobody knows. Do you love me more than these? More than his own life? More than these things? Maybe all these. Peter Yes, Lord, you know that I'll twice. Do you love me? Yes, do you love me? So what is he doing? What is Jesus doing there? I believe he is recreating the scene of Peter's greatest failure. 
There are only two places in the entire New Testament where charcoal fire is mentioned. One is in Caiaphas' courtyard, and one is here on the shore of, of the Sea of Galilee. When you come in off of a cold night, and there's nothing any colder than lake water at dawn, he's soaking wet. And those of you, many of you are from the north, right? In the south, we don't know anything about it. But you come in on a cold, wet, snowy night, and there's a fire in the fireplace. You can't stop yourself. Or, you know, but... <laughs> and Peter comes to the fire and puts his hands out and looks across that charcoal fire into the eyes of Jesus. And the scene on the rooftop at Caiaphas, at Caiaphas' house, is recreated. Remember, Peter denied Jesus three times, then the cock crows, and Jesus is taken in handcuffs across the courtyard, and their eyes meet. Jesus recreates the scene. Now, why three times? Three times his denial, three times his Reconstruction of love, three times Jesus renews him not only to relationship but to call. Now the place where this scene is celebrated on the shore of Galilee, now Sea of Galilee now, uh, I know we have several Catholics here, uh, it's the church of the primacy is there, meaning the, the, the primary call of, of Peter as Pope, if you knew, whatever, I'm not here to deal with all that. I think it should be called the Church of the Restoration because it's irrespective of, of the office to which Jesus calls Peter, the fact of the matter is he just calls him back into ministry. He, he's going to heal him, restore him, forgive him, and refresh his call all in one moment by recreating the scene of his failure. So I... Uh, I'd gone to preach at a small church outside of Augusta, Georgia, and the pastor said before the service, there's a lady here that suffers from just debilitating migraine headaches. I've, I've never ever had that, so I don't know, but hers are not just bad headaches. They put her out for a week, and she can't keep a job, and it's just, just life-changing, life-altering. And he said um, she wants us to pray for her. So brought her in, anointed her with oil, and I was just going to pray for her. And when I reached my hands over to pray for her, I had an experience. I'm not handy with words like vision, I don't, but I had an experience in my mind, all right? I don't want to overstate this. Let me show you what it's like, if you will. Close your eyes real tight and think of a horse. Now think of it. Now open your eyes. Like that. I had a picture in my mind as clear as I can see you, I saw a little girl standing on the back porch, if you will, a concrete stoop of a house. But I could see her so clearly, I could even see the dress she had on. And a little navy blue dress with a white lace collar. She was standing facing the door and had her fists against her chest like this. And she was crying, just crying bitterly. And it was so sudden I just said to the lady, Tommy Tyson taught me years ago, never hit people over the head with the gifts, offer them. And so I said, look, I've had an odd experience here. I'd like to just tell you about it. If it has any relevance, then we can think about it. And if you say, I have no clue what that means, then we'll move on. Instead of, you know, a thus saith the Lord moment, it's an offer. So I told her about it. She said, I know exactly what it is. She said, I'm the fifth of five children. The other four were boys, and I was an accident and an unwanted accident. She said, the, my next oldest brother was 10 when I was born. So when I was 10, he was 20. And my mother made me aware from the day I was born, I didn't expect you, and I don't want you, and I don't love you. And she said, I knew it my whole life. And she said, on my 10th birthday, I got two gifts. The lady next door made me a navy blue dress with a white doily collar. 
And she said, I put it on and wore it because it was pretty, but she said, I was angry because it was the lady next door and not my mother. She said, the other thing was I got a $10 bill, $1 for each year from an out-of-town aunt. When I opened the card at my breakfast, my mother reached across the table and said, what does a 10-year-old girl need with $10? And snatched it out of my hand and gave it to my 20-year-old brother. And she said, I raced onto the back porch and slammed the door. And before our eyes, her voice, her face, her voice became the voice of a little girl. She clenched her fists and she screamed, I hate you. She opened her eyes and she said, you know, I guess I've been pretty much sick since I was 10 years old. You ever hear this phrase, you make me sick? Yeah. Actually, we do. Make ourselves and each other sick. Now, I'm not disparaging counseling. I've done a great deal of it. But I am saying that we could have spent 20 years in psychotherapy and not reached that moment. That God brought her back to a moment of hurt and hate and healing began to go in. I kept track of her and her pastor for years after that, and she was not spontaneously and immediately totally healed, but she began to be healed that day until finally it was the migraine headaches were nothing but a minor disturbance in her life. But it began in that room in that moment. That's what Jesus is doing here. He takes Peter to the charcoal fire in Caiaphas' courtyard. He, he reminds him that the failure at Caiaphas' courtyard was a failure of choosing life over love. Peter's weakness was not money. That was, that was Judas Iscariot's weakness. Peter's weakness was self-preservation. You remember the story of Ananias and Sapphira. You remember that story, right? They, they tried to mean, manipulate Simon Peter with money and he struck them both dead. <laughs> we'll teach you to lie about the offering, by the way. I just wanted to mention that. As a... <laughs> but then in, in, some, in Samaria, in Acts chapter 8, you remember Simon the magician, Simon Magus. He then tried to purchase the baptism of the Holy Spirit with money. Give, the, give me that power that on whomsoever I lay my hands, he may receive the Holy Spirit. So it was simony. He was trying to purchase the apostolic ministry. And Peter says, in the King James Version, thy money perish with thee. But those of you who have studied it in Greek, you know that's not what it says in Greek. In Greek it says to hell with you and your money. Peter struggled with his mouth till he died. It was just... But... Uh, No, I think he meant it literally. I think he's saying that's a hellish suggestion. You, that idea, that concept. But Peter wasn't tempted. If Simon the magician had just bothered to Google up Ananias and Sapphira, <laughs> he would have known he couldn't tempt him with that. He was never tempted with money. What's this mean? It means your temptation is not hers, and hers is not yours, and yours is not his. We all deal with some level of self and flesh and carnality. There's something. Hurt, hate, bitterness, sexuality, something. We all, there's something we all struggle with. And Jesus knows exactly what the struggle is. And he is, this is, listen, can you hear this? Jesus is not disgusted with you. He may be hurt. He may want to help you, heal you, forgive you. But I think we feel the emotion of disgust and we project it onto Christ. But Christ never says to anybody, I'm disgusted with you. And if he would have said it to anybody, it would have been Simon Peter. I told you. I told you you would deny me three times. I told you. What did you say? Oh, no, Lord. These other lightweights, they may fail you. I go with you all the way to the... I told you. And unless you've ever struggled with repeated sin, which I think includes everybody in the room, but 
then you know exactly what happened in the Caiaphas courtyard. He denied Jesus, and then he said, oh, I wasn't ready. I wasn't ready. They caught me off guard. I wasn't ready. Let them ask me that one more time. Do you know Jesus? No. Oh, okay. Okay, I'm ready this time. I'm ready. And that's the woundedness of sin. I know sin is wrong, not making light of sin. Sin is evil. It's also, it also has a wounding effect. Peter is wounded by his own sin, by his own failure. And Jesus, instead of glossing it over, he takes him back. He says, I want you to visit this. I want you to see this. I want you to see this charcoal fire. I want our eyes to meet. I want your hands extended across the fire, warming yourself. And you see me. I want to recreate that. Now, do you love me? Yes, Lord, I love you. No, no. Do you love me? You know that I love you. Do you love me? All three times, he follows the interrogation with the commission. Feed my sheep. Feed my lambs. I, I don't want to quibble over vocabulary. I think a lot of preachers make a lot of difference over that Jesus is using agape, love me. Peter's using phileo. But remember, they weren't speaking Greek. <laughs> That's just in the Greek New Testament. We don't know what. They weren't speaking Greek. They're speaking Aramaic or Hebrew. We don't know what verbs were, they were using, really. The point is none of those things. The point is the reconnection to love. What Jesus wants from you this morning is that you love him again. He just says, do you still love me? I know you failed. I know you've fallen. I know you've had bad thoughts, stupid thoughts, wicked motives. I know you despise your sister-in-law. But do you love me? Yes, I love you, Lord. Do you love me? Yes, I love you. Do you love me? Yes, I love you. Then he says, then I'm not through with you. I still have a purpose for your life. Well, let me close with this. I came across a, a, some woman's magazine many years ago. I, I think it might have been Woman's Day. I'm not sure what it was. Anyway, some, they had done a survey with their readership. And uh, they had asked, what is your favorite thing? It was one of these sort of frivolous surveys. What is your favorite thing for somebody to say to you? What do you want to hear more than anything else? There's somebody else to say to you. I guess number one. Can't you? I love you. That's the number one thing. I mean, that, if, that phrase, if that phrase is not the favorite thing for anybody to hear, then Hallmark movies are over. I can tell you that. I love you. That's the number one thing. The second one surprised me. The second most beloved thing to have someone else say to you, do you know what it was? I forgive you. I was flabbergasted. I love you. I forgive you. I think people walk around with a load of guilt all the time. I think you could stand on a street corner in downtown New York and say to people as they walk by, I forgive you, I forgive you, I forgive you. I think people would stop and say, thanks, man, I'll never do it again. <laughs> I think people walk around with a load of guilt. I love you, I forgive you. The third one made me laugh. I laughed right out loud. Supper's ready. <laughs> <laughs> and you did too. I was laughing, and then all of a sudden... God, it hit me. I said, oh, my God. That's the law and the prophets. That's everything. That's all we've got. Every priest in the place. Listen, every time you serve the Lord's Supper, that's all you've got to say. Everything else you say is just extra. You point to the elements and you say, thus saith the Lord. I love you. I forgive you. Come and dine. Come and dine. What a precious Lord. He knows everything you've ever said or done or thought. And his table is the table of renewal and healing and forgiveness 
and the summons to serve him from this moment on. Come and dine, the master calleth. Come and dine. You can feast at Jesus' table all the time. Well, let's pray. Heavenly Father, as we receive this, your table of grace and forgiveness and renewal, we pray for healing. Mind, body, spirit. Lord, despite our failures, we love you. Why don't you tell him that with your eyes closed? Say, Lord, I love you. Just in your own way. Don't wait for me. Fire at will. Say, Lord, I love you. I love you. I don't always act like it. I know I disappoint you, but I love you. I do love you. I love you. Now listen, as a word of prophecy, can you hear this? Thus saith the Lord, I love you too. Now, say to him, forgive me. Forgive me, forgive me. Forgive me, forgive me. We confess our sins. The very memory of them is grievous unto us. Have mercy upon us, most merciful Father, for, for our, your Son, our Lord Jesus Christ's sake. Lord, we, we plead for forgiveness. Ask him, forgive me, forgive me, forgive me. Say it, have mercy on me, forgive me, forgive me. <clears throat> now thus saith the Lord, I forgive you. I forgive you. This is my blood, a whole new covenant. For the forgiveness of sins, and not for yours only, but for the sins of the whole world. I forgive you. Now you say to him, Lord, I want to be different. Tell him, I want to be different. I want to come away from this table different. Thank you for forgiveness. I want to be healed. I want to be changed. I want to be different. I want to be better. Tell him. Now thus saith the Lord, this is my body. Feed on me by faith and with thanksgiving. Daily, hourly, minute by minute. I still want to use your life. In the mighty name Jesus, the strong son of God, the resurrection from the dead, and our healing savior. Amen, amen, and amen. <laughs>